Good evening, this is Gary Kavner here on the right side. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwyer. Michael, how are you? I'm great. I'm delighted to be back talking about Brexit. Yes, today is Monday the 21st of the 10th, 2019, and it's finally time. It's time for the covenant to be fulfilled and the Brexit episode to be published. This is not to say Brexit is finished, because at this stage Brexit will live forever, at least in our hearts and in my notes. The scars will not heal. They will not go away. So, things have finally gotten interesting with Brexit. What's <laughs> happening with it? <laughs> Playing fast and loose with interesting there, Gary, I would say. Anyway. Ah, uh, God. Letwin, the Letwin Amendment. The Letwin Amendment, Johnson abiding by his legal requirements. Kind of, sort of. Pretty much. I think, I think the phrase is, the letter of the law, but perhaps not the spirit. <laughs> the dispirit of the law. Okay, well, just let's get the, the details on the table. Let me just give you an idea of what's happened. Boris Johnson managed, despite the fact everyone in the know said it was pretty much impossible, managed to get the EU to renegotiate parts of the deal. The deal they have come back together with is substantially similar to, to Theresa May's, However, both the EU and Britain moved on a number of areas. So this was the standard thing of, it's the very last second, there's 20 days till Brexit, okay, now we'll actually negotiate seriously. But he got it. He actually got something that kind of managed to keep most people happy. Mm -hmm. And even the DUP nearly got on board with it, before nearly. they very much didn't. So he, he did this thing. He he got this deal, finally. There's a couple of weeks to go to Brexit. He's going to put this thing forward, and it is going to be the thing that stops Britain from crashing out with a no deal. And he brings it to Parliament to vote on. And Parliament did something quite smart, because Parliament didn't want to vote against this deal. Because if you vote against the deal and Britain crashes out of the EU yes. on the 31st, as it will if no other deal is signed into place, then you could be blamed. So what they did is Labour and a couple of other people came behind an amendment to the bill, put forward by a Tory, or rather ex-Tory MP, called Letwin. Now Letwin is not a new guy. He's been around the block here. He's the guy who brought in the poll tax in Britain. Well, he, So he's a man who's used to not being publicly liked. Letwin didn't bring in the poll tax, but he was maybe, he was one of the, one of the brains behind it in, in, in the background. Behind it was it. seen as Letwin's policy and reported as Letwin's policy. And he took the abuse from it being Letwin's policy. But he brought forward an amendment which basically meant that Johnson would have to ask for the amendment. Or sorry, he would have to ask for an extension of the time period and the Parliament say on the Johnson bill or the Johnson deal wouldn't be considered final until the deal was signed with the EU and he, Johnson came back, put forward a bill to implement the deal and that was signed off on. Mm -hmm. So it was basically a way to force the extension to go ahead. And it got true and that meant that the deal didn't really have to be voted on at all, because the final say on the deal hasn't happened yet. Also interesting to note that if Johnson, if this is how it goes down, and Johnson signs the deal with the EU, brings it back, and then brings forward a bill to implement it into the British uh, legal system, and to get parliamentary assent to it, they will also be able to try and put amendments on that bill. So even if Johnson gets the EU to sign the deal, and everyone agrees with it, and Parliament is okay with it, in the abstract, it might still fail. So Letwin has royally bollocksed this entire thing. Yeah, the, 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 the curious thing is, because uh, Oliver Letwin is one of those very clever Tories, of the likes of, uh, say, John Redwood and, and others, widely considered to be very very clever chap, maybe a touch too clever, uh, so he had this wheeze, this, this tremendously clever idea. And it worked, well, insofar as Parliament voted for it. But all that the British press seem to be reporting today is Letwin voted for, uh, proposed this idea, but now he doesn't know quite what to do with it 
know that he's got it. Did you the, the Telegraph, as its headline, yeah. had Oliver Letwin, the cleverest moron in Westminster. <laughs> Sorry, the cleverest stupid person in Westminster. This was, after all, the Telegraph. Yeah. So there was that word that he had done this. He's royally bollocks the deal. And now there seems some uncertainty as to whether Letwin actually understood how what this was going to do. So that goes forward. It passes. The Letwin Amendment comes in. Johnson then knows he can't get through the deal on time. A previous act called the Ben Act that Letwin actually also helped with, mm-hmm. and he was Letwin lost the whip, so he was he lost his place as a Tory MP for voting for the Ben Act because he was sponsored. The bill was sponsored by Ben in in this case being Hillary Ben, former Labour uh, Secretary for Foreign Aid, and the son of Tony Ben. Uh, another who was not a Labour, but a Tory clever person, but a Labour clever person. I thought he was a prick myself, but you, everybody else now says lovely things about him because he's a great defender of Parliament and very, very conscious. And all that. I thought he was a pompous prick, but very clever guy. Anyway, Ben, as a it was a it was an opposition piece of legislation he supported. He lost the whip. And the Ben, so now it, they have to automatically trigger the Ben Amendment, which means that he has to ask for, as you say, Gary, he has to ask for the extension. Well, no, that's, is, that's what they <laughs> thought but, they had ba- they so, had made him do. So he sent a, he sent a, I believe, an unsigned letter. He, he even, sent. It was suggested it wasn't. It didn't even have a letterhead. I don't so know what if that's what true. they did was the the <coughs> act. The act was intended to make him ask for an extension. Yes. What it actually meant is he had to send the letter. So what he did was he photocopied the letter, apparently from the act, and just sent it with no signature. Copy and paste. And then sent it along with a signed letter directly from Boris Johnson saying, well, chaps, I'm afraid we don't want an extension. Now, if you're in Europe and you get this, I imagine your reaction is, well, okay, no extension. So this is a difficult one for Europe. Because they want the Brits gone. It's like a drunk person at a party. They're great fun. They say goodbye. They weren't so drunk, they were messy. And then it's two hours later and they still won't leave your house. Yeah. And they're getting a bit messier. That's kind of what Britain is now. They're going to leave eventually. The EU has finally decided their hope of reversing this is not realistic. And for about a year and a half or two years, they legitimately believed there was a fairly solid chance Britain would just reverse Brexit. And I think that that, is part, that point is, is kind of important because one of the reasons that this whole process has become so long and, and torturous is I think that there was a significant voice within the EU which thought, if we can string this along, if we can make this difficult, if we can make it complicated and awkward, there is a real chance that they will simply give up. They'll give up or else they'll go back and have another referendum. And having seen the, the error of their ways, they will change their minds and the people will vote and say, OK, we're going to stay in Europe. They have now been convinced that that's not going to happen. So that they're starting to, in a sense, maybe it's only in the last little while that certain sections of Europe are actually, ad, are actually negotiating in good faith. Yeah, so we we have a situation where Boris Johnson has abided effectively by the law, letter of the law, kind of urinated all over the spirit of it, but no one really cares about the spirit. Mm-hmm. And now Europe has to make a decision whether or not they'll grant an extension. Now, the Scottish courts are considering whether or not they should sign a letter, the Scottish Supreme Court, they should sign a letter and send it to Europe seeking the extension. I have no idea of the legal intricacies uh, there. That seems totally insane. But I don't understand the uh, the Scottish legal system enough to kind of go, is this actually sanity or not? I imagine it is total nonsense there. It sounds bizarre. I mean, if anybody was going to do that in Scotland, you would have imagined it would have been the executive of the Scottish government, uh, the leader of the Scottish parliament, the... First Minister of Scotland, the SNP, whoever. But the idea that the courts would put themselves 
in sort in in local parentis like that of the state seems very odd. No overreach. So I I don't know what Europe is going to do on this. Well, nobody knows what anybody's going to do. But what we do know, what we think we know, is at the moment is there were there was going to be a vote, and they decided not to have the vote, which was uh, on Sunday. However, there is going to be a vote. Uh, this evening, this Monday evening, there might be a vote. It is the intention at the moment of the government to put a vote down, uh, or what is what they like to call a meaningful vote. However, it is the convention of Parliament that you do not put down a meaningful vote on this of this, which is substantially the same within the same session in Parliament. So it is possible that the speaker, John Burkow, who has been an activist speaker in this debate so far, could choose to refuse. He could choose to refuse to allow them to uh, put the vote. However, Gary, from what we can see of Burkow and his character, I think that's unlikely because at this point, everybody has been speaking very positively oh my God, it's a deal, it's a deal. Considering that not that long ago, there had been deepening uh, gloom regarding the possibility of execution, finding a deal. Johnson seems to have done something. He seems to be successful. To everybody's surprise, uh, he's got something. Does Burko want to risk X number of years down the line, people pointing at him in the street saying, there's the guy that stopped us getting the deal. Yes, and if things go to the wall and Burko is the person who did that, that's not going to be a comfortable thing for Burko or Burko's legacy. Now, I, I do think there is an amusement here in that that uh, precedent about a similar bill not coming back in the same sitting of Parliament. That was uh, recently rediscovered by Burko. It's from the 17th century. Uh-huh. So now he may have to uh, decide where he falls on that. And it would be a bit embarrassing to have to turn around and go, well, I'll allow this one. Not that I think he'll be embarrassed by it. I have actually, I, the, the text of the letters has actually been released now. Yeah. Uh, there's the unsigned letter, which is two paragraphs long. There is an ambassador's letter explaining why this is happening. And then there is a signed letter from the PM, which is... Two pages long, and um, basically says, "You have the ability to grant this request." I think that would be uh, damaging to the interests of everyone. And he's got a pretty good point. This parliament has shown it can't agree on anything. Yeah, I mean, they have voted against what fifteen different Brexit deals, and it has always been the. It has already at least been stated to be the case that at this point an extension would only be granted in circumstances where there was good reason to believe that an extension would lead to some kind of positive outcome, that there was actually a, a chance, a reasonable chance. It's a bit like an old just war theory. You have to have a reasonable chance of winning the war. There has to be a reasonable chance of getting this, getting a deal out of this. Now, Johnson could reasonably say, well, lads, you know, if you accept this, if you allow them to do this, you're just going to confirm them in their in in, in their bad behaviour. And the reality is, it, we have to do is bully them a bit into accepting that this is the deal. We have the deal. This is the only deal. No, they, they've shown they will not accept anything. So I think the really the only thing, well, sorry, the best thing here would be for the refusal of an extension. I'm sure it was to your great surprise that uh, we saw the DUP voting no. Well they voted, voting. well, they voted to the DUP, voted for the Letwin Amendment. They voted and yes, it was, it eyed the amendment. Sorry, yes, no they, the they, they went with it. It was thought that they would um, hold off, that they wouldn't agree with this. <clears throat> and they turned up slightly late to the vote, and then they went with it. And I believe their votes, I don't think this amendment would have passed had they voted the opposite way. So well, that's the DUP, though, isn't it? I, I think. Well, it's hard. Northern politics is different. It's, it's different. It's sui generis. But we know 
that uh, the North is not uh, Brexit friendly. Now we know the DUP voters are mostly Brexit friendly, but we also know that large numbers of them wanted they're they, they're happy enough with Brexit as long as they get a deal. For there, the DUP has a number, quite a number of rural constituencies uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of farmers, a lot of farming votes. And there's one thing, and I think we we may have adverted this before, but when we talk about a, a, a no deal, a no deal uh, Brexit, there are certain things that will happen immediately, barring very specific contingencies created by agreement, special agreement between the EU, Ireland, and the UK. But one, for example, the northern the Northern Irish dairy industry would basically be destroyed in the space of a couple of weeks because there is no spare capacity for liquid milk in the in the in Great Britain both little and aldi source their liquid milk from the north of ireland if there if it came in to, tomorrow that milk for either because of uh, the kind of restrictions that are imposed on food products coming from outside the eu where there are no agreed standards and there are no treaties and are issues regarding tariffs because if there will be a standard tariff on food there'll be standard tariffs on milk perhaps even even under WTO rules which would make the milk in the north uh, excessively expensive for anybody bringing it to the south that if they don't have a place to if they can't bring their milk south for some reason any reason for the first week, they'll just their biggest job will be disposing of milk, and then within a, a week of that, they will have to start to cull cattle, and very quickly you could see the actual destruction of the dairy herd in the north of Ireland. Now, that would surely have cataclysmic prospects if the DUP were were held to be responsible for no deal, and if they were to be held by farmers responsible for no deal Brexit and that happening. I think that that would be potentially cataclysmic for them. You could see a real change in the politics. And yet they don't seem to be worried by that. Or maybe they're worried, but they just can't help themselves. It's just no, 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 no. It is what they know. It is, in, I, would, I don't actually know many people associated with the DUP, but I am actually quite interested in what they think they're doing here and how they think they can swing this. Because, yeah, a no-deal Brexit will remove any sort of border that might, even a partial border on whatever in the ocean that might be put in place by a Brexit, by any sort of deal, yeah, a no-deal would avoid that. It'll also devastate parts of Northern Ireland. So... There were articles going around a few weeks, ago, well, in the last couple of weeks, Basically, poo-pooing the idea that a no deal, a crashing out no deal Brexit would have any kind of real impact on border communities, and this was just another version of well, Operation Fear. But I've been actually up and down for work for the last couple of years, been in places like um, Straban, and I can tell you, mm -hmm. if you talk to people there, they are very, very much or anywhere in Donegal. And I'm sure this is particularly Donegal, but it's I'm sure it's it's true part in Cavan, uh, Monaghan as well, parts of Leitrim and indeed in Louth. That if you're right on the border, uh, there are real serious problems that have to be dealt with. It's possible over the long term that a no deal Brexit, the border counties would adapt to it. The things the immediate impact is not going to be pleasant. Though. Things sort themselves out, but the immediate impact could be really, really nasty. For specific, I mean, not for everybody, perhaps, but for specific industries and for specific. But and listen, everybody at the end of the day is 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 a single voter, and they don't tend to see things in the broader context. I I have enjoyed looking at the the headlines on the British papers this Sunday. Ah, oh, they've been fantastic, Michael. The uh, the mail on Sunday. Theirs was at the House of Fools. Yeah. The Sunday Express was um, just the question, why won't they let us leave? Yeah, who's the they? Parliament, one assumes. Because yeah. it, 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 it used to be, you could read a, a, a headline like that and just assume 
that they were inevitably talking about the bad Europeans, but it's not clear anymore. The uh, the male called Sir Oliver a useful idiot. The Sun on Sunday, their headline was Oliver Twits. <laughs> yeah, they then called obvious. him a buffoon uh, who came up with the poll tax and has now persuaded zombie MPs to block Brexit. Mm. Uh, the Sun goes after the DUP. The Sunday Times has one of the Labour MPs saying that this is going to destroy any chance of a deal. <clears throat> it's all going poorly. One of the one of the ironies, and and I'm restricting myself just to the one irony, but one of the ironies of this is that if you were to ask many uh, good faith, decent Brexiteer people why they left. The single co- most common reason that people is that they wanted to bring back power control to London, which they felt either, in fact, well, maybe not to London, on, well, to Westminster, but which they felt either, or they certainly perceived, had been lost to a, a fundamentally undemocratic super state in Europe. And they wanted, as they and they would very often say, we you know, we 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 want to be governed by our own parliament, the mother of parliaments. We have this very ancient, rich democratic heritage, and by implication, and quite correctly, that many people in Europe didn't have quite that same democratic heritage, that parliamentary heritage. And it was all about this. The wonderful thing that the mother of parliaments in my semester is, and I, I suspect that when all of this is done and dusted. The opinion that people will have out in the sticks of the Mother of Parliaments will never have been lower. The sense of people have of democracy in Britain at the moment is really being damaged. No, I mean, I, I have no real stake in Brexit. To be fair, I think it would have been better if Britain stayed in because I'm, I'm into that old school real politic. I like balancing out the Germans and the French. I like them to stay in because I think that from the perspective of Irish interests, it's much yeah. better for us. They're also much more serious about pushing those interests. Yeah. And now that they're going, we're going to have a moment of, oh, we actually have to do these things. Yes. Oh, God. But there is, even I, just from having to pay attention to this, the other frustration you get when something just doesn't work, when it, like a piece of machinery or a pen or a piece of software just does not work. It's not fit for purpose. And you've run all of the fixes and done all of the tabs and you've done everything they tell you on Microsoft and it still won't work. And it's still, and you eventually reach a point of, I'm just going to have to replace this. Yeah. Uh, but then you can't replace it because you're locked in somehow. That's kind of how I feel about this. This parliament is totally unable to deal with the issue. Regardless of what side you're on, they cannot actually come to a conclusion. And now they're terrified of what will happen in a vote because they keep doing things to throw Johnson off. And instead of Johnson falling, he's becoming more and more popular. The Conservative Party is becoming, I think they're polling at 37%. They're which, polling, if you're, yeah, if you're yeah. in a first-past-the-post system, that's, that's pretty well, solid. It, well, it, is, it wouldn't have been once upon a time. Once upon a time, you would have, you went back in Maggie's day, you would have had to be getting on 43%, 44% to be guaranteed. Now, but on, in, in current conditions, the, the thing is that they're 37%. Labour are, way, are back like on what, 25%? And that's 37%. With Brexit Party still polling at 11%. So there is a real chance, because a lot of those Brexit votes are actually are disaffected Labour votes in seats in the Midlands and the North East, uh, traditional working class Labour constituencies who strongly were for Brexit and feel alienated from the Labour Party but can't bring themselves to vote Tory. And if you see a split of the vote in some of those constituencies, it could be, a, 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 we don't know, but it could be an absolute bloodbath. But the figures as they stand, it, it, it's also true here, but particularly in their system, if you come, if you if you get the largest uh, portion of the votes, you get a, a seat bonus, a disproportionate seat bonus. The bigger the gap between the first and second parties, hmm. the bigger that seat bonus is. When you look at like the polls that came out this week, 
So you have conservatives at 36. Another has them at 32, another 33, another 37. Yeah. All in that region. Labour go 27, 24, 29, 24, 22. You were talking at least a 10 point gap and in some cases up to a 15. In a, in a first past the vote system where the Lib Dems are on about 15 to 20 percent and now you have the Brexit party on about 10, that'll, that'll be a massacre. It could potentially, you could get some really weird results. And the machines will will crank out with all of the different permutations, with but there potentially you could see Labour really doing horrendously badly in traditional strongholds in the North and in the Midlands. The Lib Dems might do quite well because if they can if they can get their a regional buzz going. The Lib Dems tend to do best in the southwest, on the south coast, and in the southeast. Now, if they can get that buzz going in the southwest, get some, get those Labour votes in, get the get the Remainer Tories on board, then they could do solidly well. There was a YouGov poll uh, this week, um, about four days ago. It had Labour behind the Tory party in every region. Yeah. Including London. Yeah. That's, and that wasn't just England. That was every region of the UK. And one of the things to remember here is, once upon a time, they could, the, Labour could rely on Scotland to basically give them an automatic top up. There are, Scotland I, has a disproportionate amount of seats. I think there are 60 Westminster seats in Scotland, roughly, would say. But I think it's pretty close to 60. As we speak, I think something in the high 50s are held by the SNP. In other words, this, even on a good day for the SNP, you know, considering that the Tories had been decimated in Scotland, it wasn't always so. Uh, but the, the Scots hate, hated Thatcher for various reasons. And one of the reasons you mentioned the poll tax was because the first place they, they experimented with the poll tax was in Scotland. They ran it as a trial. Actually, you, um, the the SNP used to have that kind of number. In the 2017 elections, though, they lost over 20 seats. What are they down to now? They, I don't have the exact figure. I'd say 34, 35. Conservatives went up 12 seats. Conservatives got, yeah, became, and became the second party, became the second party. Labour Which is bizarre. also did better. The Lib Dems did better. Pretty much everyone but the SNP. But uh, Labour did, did better, better, yes. But I'm, you're talking... Having, 2017 as well. Yeah, they did better, but you're talking about... Uh, like they took half a dozen... Uh, may, maybe half a dozen to ten seats, as opposed to once upon a time taking 50 seats. This is... this is Because I have the figures now here. This is actually a really good indication of how first past the post works. Okay. So the Lib Dems get 179,000 votes. They get four seats. Right. Labour gets 717,000. They get seven seats. Right. The Conservatives get 757,000. They get 13 seats. Yeah. And the SNP gets 19,000... Oh, sorry, 977,000. They get 35 seats. Because first past the post... really disproportionately benefits anyone who's a couple of points ahead in the right way. And it also it, it, it also gives you the benefit if you can clump your support. So if you if you, you can get relative speaking low a low total proportion of the vote. But if mm. you can get all of your vote in seven or eight constituencies Yeah, you'll take them. You can take eight seats. But if on the other hand you get as it regularly used to happen, back in the eighties I think in eighty three, possibly or eighty seven. I can't remember which. Labour got twenty seven percent of the vote, and the STP Liberal Alliance got twenty five percent of the vote. Hmm. But Labour ended up with like two hundred seats more than. Them. Well, just just look at uh, Theresa May. Theresa May runs on raw vote percentage a very good uh, election. Yes. However, support for the third parties collapses. These would yeah. be the parties that. 
apart from the major conservatives and the um, the um, Labour. And because the third party vote share collapses, she ends up in an incredibly tenuous situation. Yeah, she actually gets more votes than Thatcher did uh, in eighty seven, and she got a and Thatcher got a landslide. Mm, absolutely, but there is there is because this is going to keep going. But there is one thing I wanted to quickly touch on with you, Michael. I'm curious about your views on this. Yeah, I was thinking about the problem here. Seems to be but well, there's lots of problems. But Britain has spent two years. The Parliament has spent two years fighting against itself. And I'd be really interested in if Parliament had united after this vote, let's say it had been a cleaner victory, maybe 60 or 65%, Mm -hmm. and Parliament had come together between either a deal or whatever, how do you think that would have gone much different? I think the EU, because Britain was so riven and so unsure about what it was going to do, that the EU kind of went, ah, this is like, they're going to back away from this because this is lunacy. But they could never get the numbers to back away in the same way they couldn't get the numbers to move forward. Yeah, I I know what you mean. I think that in some ways you almost had the worst of all possible worlds in the result of the election, in the the referendum. Now, it wasn't quite 49-51, but it was was 48-52. So it's it's 3-4% of a gap. Now, first thing to remember that this was a very, very big surprise. Nobody expected it. No, Farage was meant to be getting ready to give his, uh, yeah. well, we've lost. Yeah, but we should, we fight on. Uh, there was no, So people had not psychologically prepared themselves for the idea that they were going to have to enter into this negotiation. The Europeans had not psychologically been prepared for the idea that they were going to have to actually deal with this fact. Now, you said six. I think that even if it had been 45, 55, that, that could have been enough. Because that's a 10% difference. And a 10% difference would have been hard to swing. Very hard. But say 60, 40, okay, in a, in a magic real, if we want to make a, an ideal scenario, 60, 40 is a 20% difference. You have to accept that. That's a, that's a, that's a knockout win. And more to the point, even if it would have been the case that most of the people in Parliament would still have been Remainers because the Parliament would have remained a majority of Remainers. They would have been forced into the position of recognising that they had a clear, unambiguous message which was not going to be changed from the people that they had, they had that Britain was going to leave the EU and there was nothing they could do. Also, simple political reality would have had to dawn on them that if 60% of the people were voting that way, then a hell of a lot of those Remainers, unless they came on board and did the job they were being asked to do, were putting their seats in very serious jeopardy. And no MP, TD or Senator anywhere in the world is going to like to do that. So I think, yes, I think that if there had been a a clear, unambiguous victory... No, it's... it's, it's you know what, it makes me a little bit... Um, let's say more positive towards the French Revolution. Maybe there is a time for just guillotining people. It's kind of hard to stop the guillotining though once it starts. Uh, that's the problem with these. They're like the uh, the Pringles of revolution. Although, I mean, the French Revolution, for all that it was a terrible revolution for reasons of philosophy and political science we don't need to get into now, it did have two real positives. One, Maximilian Robespierre ended up getting guillotined, and uh, John Paul Marat. He was assassinated by a woman called um, Charlotte Corday. Corday killed him with a uh, five-inch kitchen knife. Apparently, his last words were, Help me, my beloved, presumably in French. During her four-day trial, she testified that she had carried out the assassination alone, saying, I killed one man to save a hundred thousand. But anyway, I think we should we should leave it on that. We've drifted from Brexit. All the best. Bye-bye. Do, do go read about the oppression of the French Revolution. Stop reading about Brexit for a couple of days. Life is too short and you're too young.